Sorry, I'm going to speak English again, guys, with my wonderful accent, which is about uh, as good as Baptiste, probably, more or less. Uh, well, it's probably going to be a somewhat funny talk for various reasons. So, uh, Mark SP from OpenBSD and LSE as well. Uh, let's see if this works. Uh, yep. So, uh, you can see the OpenBSD emblem uh, working for once, <laughs> which is cool. And uh, basically, I'm going to talk about some very recent work because uh, actually I have a time frame. I've looked at things, and I realized that uh, I started this just three months ago. So uh, what am I doing, what I'm going to talk about is uh, trying to switch Airport 3 from uh, GCC, all time GCC, because uh, licensing issues and stuff like that, to a much more recent clang, uh, which is still a work in progress, because more or less everything works now, Spoilers. But uh, we haven't uh, managed to convince uh, TO that it's a good idea to switch right now. So it's probably going to happen after the current release cycle, so probably for 6.3 for OpenBSD, hopefully. And the time frame is as follows. Like, uh, we imported uh, the first actual architecture using only Silang uh, last December, because RM64, you've got to just uh, realize that there's no way whole time GCC and Minutes are going to support that. And then uh, Stuart, uh, who is a crazy guy, uh, started uh, building ports on RM64 and realized that we needed some extra support for it for various reasons. I'm going to talk about that. And then, uh, surprise, Nadi managed to convince Theo that maybe it was a good idea to activate the Silang build by default on uh, MD64 and, and uh, over Intel architectures, uh, just so that we could test. And right after that, because I'm crazy too, I decided to try to figure out uh, whether I could build the port tree with Silang. And uh, looking at the last commits, we're about three months later, and about everything works, except for uh, LibreOffice and Chromium. But uh, I think that Chromium is getting solved as we speak, and uh, there's a high chance that I'm going to have uh, Ports 3 with uh, Robert's work on Chromium that we'll build uh, by tomorrow, with luck. So uh, the basic idea is uh, to jump in the deep end. Uh, fortunately, we already have tools that uh, allow us to do some interesting things on our system. Uh, mostly, we have a package builder that is uh, somewhat efficient. And uh, more importantly, we have a tool, Prout, which I talked about uh, last year, uh, which allows us to uh, be able to build stuff uh, on a working system without uh, crashing everything and keeping things separate, like uh, having simple CH routes without any trouble. Uh, on the minus side, uh, the OpenBSD toolchain is a complete nightmare. Uh, it has been so for a long time and it's even worse right now because we have already uh, a real version of GCC in base a somewhat less ancient version in ports. Don't laugh, GCC 4.9, it's that's back from, I guess, 2003 or something like that, uh, which has some minimal modern C++ support, which is what we needed. And this means that you end up with two versions of the uh, lib standard C++. Yeah, I see Baptiste saying, yeah. <laughs> which is always fun because those are supposed to be mostly compatible except when they're not, right Antoine? Uh, yeah, we just had a mix up uh, on uh, which tool was that? Well, one of those tools where mixing both Flip standard C++ was a bad idea. And then because we are different, when we are building stuff with Clang, instead of doing the things the, Luni the Linux way, we are doing it uh, our own way using Lab C++ which is a BSD li licensed uh, standard C++ library. Uh, so this means that uh, we are going to run into all kinds of issues that almost nobody else uh, has run into before. 
except for FreeBSD, and not even then everything, because there are some interesting differences between both operating systems. Oh yeah, and don't get me started on the linkers between Inutils uh, 2.15, 2.17, and now LLD, we have three different sets of linkers which are widely incompatible for about everything. Fun, right? So, um, how does it start? Well, uh, you start to build, and yeah, sure, we've got DPB, so everything is going to work just fine, except that not quite. Actually, the first time you start a C-Long build, it's mostly going to look like this. Everything is broken. Like the first bit, I had maybe 400 ports that did break. Uh, let me show you something, if I can. So what you see basically is a replay of a normal port build. So this part here is interesting. You see ports building and uh, there's nothing there. There's no action. Sometimes it gets real red because you have stuff that is mostly unpacking and repacking files, so it takes a long time to do so. And uh, in comparison, This is what the first build with Clunk looked like. See those lines? Those are ports failing. Uh, even if I chose a tiny uh, font, it's definitely going to around the screen and uh, take too much time, too much space. And uh, in the end, I think on the first build, I ended up with about 400 ports failing. Um, the main issue with that is that not only those ports are failing, but they are taking a huge part of the ports to it. Like when you don't have any Python that works, you're going to realize that you're going to lose maybe 800 ports. When you don't have a boost that builds, you're losing another 300 ports, and so on and so forth. Uh, the first breakage, I think, was libproxy, then uh, GTK2 and GTK3, uh, maybe Jellyba as well, so nothing works. Let's go back to the normal presentation. Okay, I should not have stopped this, but it should be okay. Blah, 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 where was I? Thing is broken. Come on. Ah, the other way. Yep. Right. So at this point, you might get a little bit demotivated, like 400 ports to fix. Uh, that's going to take time. Yeah, this is about the way I felt at this point. Uh, is it even worth it? Shouldn't we just drop OpenBSD and go to Linux or Windows? I don't know. Maybe it should be a good idea. Nah. Nah, we are going to try anyway. So uh, the first problems that we have to tackle usually are problems with the compilers. Like there are some incredibly stupid differences between Clang and GCC. Uh, the main issue with that is that developers tend to think that their compiler is not going to change, and so they are going to hard code lots of behavior which are completely stupid. The most interesting one, for instance, is W error. Like you've got your compiler, and everything compiles fine, you've got no warnings at all, and so you turn on W error, and then suddenly you get a new compiler, like Lang, which is uh, somewhat mo more modern, much better at analyzing stuff, and boom, you end up with this kind of errors. Like, it's just that the code used to compile just fine, and suddenly, Clang discovers that uh, actually there are some conditions which can never happen, and so it's going to fail. So, to make it very simple, W error, bad, bad idea, all the time. It's almost never worth the effort. Probably if you've got some code that you control all the way through and that you really, really, really want to be sure that there is no mistake at all, 
you can use W error, but the rest of the time, it's almost always complete bullshit because you're going to change compilers and then everything is going to break. Second one for stupid compilers, you're just strolling through the errors and you're looking at things, and blam, you get this kind of stuff. So do you have any idea what's going on there? Why do you get this kind of ideas, this kind of errors on code that was just compiling fine with GCC and suddenly with Clang, it's no longer working? Hmm? Hmm? Inline functions, yeah. <laughs> You've gone through this road before, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in case you don't know, uh, inline used to exist in GCC before it was part of the C language. Like, this stuff was standardized in uh, ISO C in 99, and it was already present in GCC for about 10 years, with obviously, hilariously different semantics. Like, the GCC inlines don't look anything like what's in the standard, and if you're trying to compile stuff with Clunk, you're going to have to insist that, yes, I know what I'm doing, and I'm using GCC inline functions, so you have to add a flag to the compile line, uh, minus F new 98 inlines, so that things work. Uh, in some cases, it can get really, really funny because you have a lot of shit uh, in between you and the compiler that insists on putting their own flags. Like, try to figure out in a set of configure scripts or cost school chains for binutil, GCC, and everything, why you have to put those flags so that it's passed to the right compiler, not to anything else that doesn't understand it. Good luck. Plus also, you have some libraries which are going to compile just fine, but they are just a ticking bomb because something else that uses those libraries is going to insist on having the right line so that it finds its function. Fun. At least, I would say, took out 50 ports. So 50 fixes. And then we're good to go to try to fix some, some more stuff. Uh, speaking of flags and uh, compilation tool chain, you get a bit further and then you get this kind of issues. Like you have a compu uh, configure script that just plain tells you that your C compiler doesn't work. Why? Because when you look at the configure source, you're going to see this line which is, yeah, you all know it, it's a perfectly normal uh, C prototype for men. Except that, remember, we are in configure land. And what does configure autoconf do to uh, square brackets like that? That's right, they vanish, because they don't exist, they're just quotes for autoconf. So in the end, you end up with the same prototype, except that it's going to take a simple pointer to argv instead of a wall array. And of course, Silang doesn't like it because it wants to have perfect prototypes for C functions. Boom. For configure, your compiler, your compiler doesn't work. Fun, right? Next one. It's more or less the same thing. Uh, people thought that trying to run the compiler with lots of options to see if these options were working was a good idea. Except that it's not, because again, Silang is very permissive in whatever options you can pass as warning. And so, minus whatever is always going to work, more or less. It's going to say, mm, this option is not supported, but it's not going to error out. But once configured has discovered that these options seem to work and that it puts it into the make file along with our friend minus w error, then everything goes kaboom. Obviously, because this option never existed. And that's fun again. So instead of fixing actual issues there, we're only fighting the configure system. Like if you're not convinced yet that autoconf is a really, really bad idea, and uh, W error as well, you should be. Because it took, uh, wow, about 
six hours out of my life that I could have used to do something more useful, probably. Okay. After this, we are left with a lot of very stupid errors that are very easy to fix. For instance, you discovered that lots of run miss headers. What's going on, actually, is that the C++ library that uh, shipped with Clang is uh, much cleaner than what we had in base. And so when you include something, you only get the header that you're asking for and not more. And so suddenly, uh, no functions exist. Uh, the second one is really fun and really old. Our GCC um, isn't really strict, and uh, it's very happy to mix up return type of functions with uh, actual return values. Uh, there's an actual historic reason, like if you look at really old time C, you're going to see functions that look like this. Uh, this is before there was void in the C language. Yeah, there was a time like that, and I've lived through that period. Oops, somewhat old. And this old code, usually, you just declared the function as having no return type, which is just implicit int. So this function is actually returning int. And then you have in the middle of a function a return that says, I don't return anything because I don't give a fuck. And the old compiler is very happy with this. In the new compiler, usually, you have to just add a void so that it's happy again. And then we have the first real what of this talk. Like, this is OK. This is old code. It's very easy to, to fix. And you also find new code that looks like this. Have you ever seen a void function that returns zero and that compiles? This used to work with GCC. And this is not just one single case. In the port three, I had to fix maybe five to 10 ports that did this. Uh, I had a very funny explanation for it by uh, Mike B who told me on ACB that, uh, well, basically, you know, it's, it's more or less portable assembly, so, yeah, you've got to return the register anyway, so who cares whether it says void or int? There's always going to be a value in your register. What? <laughs> but that's obviously how some people write C code, because it definitely works that way. Um, I also talked about templates and uh, recognizing them. Now we have some C++ code. So this kind of error you're going to see all over the place in the port tree. What's going on is, as a very simple explanation, basically the parser from GCC 4.2 is completely broken. And it does take a template and put it on the side and then actually parses it later when it's actually needed. More modern compilers tend to try to follow the standard. And so they actually pass the template when they see it. And if they see things like that, like uh, classes which aren't really defined at the point uh, they're written, they tend to complain. So this is a case-by-case -case fix where you will have to provide the right definition Often it's just uh, rearrange, rearranging the lines of the file so that you get things in the right order and that in the end it compiles. Just time consuming because you have to fix maybe uh, 30 projects or so at this point. Uh, just for the sake of completeness, what I, when I was talking about uh, missing includes, this is the kind of error that you're going to see. So. When you see the first one, you're going to look at the source tree and try to figure out where it used to get the prototype for, ti for time before, which include was wrong. Uh, when you're at the 20th or 30th error of the sort, you just don't give a shit anymore, and you just fix it. You, just, you add the missing include, and that's it, <laughs> because nobody has time to, to wait for this. Um, 
some more fun cases where definitely it looks like you have a developer that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing, more or less. Uh, when I was fixing those errors, I was thinking of this guy and, uh, okay, if he was writing some C and C++ code, this is for probably what he would write, I guess. First real what is this. Uh, this is what I got when I tried to compile uh, Python. Um, this was, was really fun. So what's going on here is that we have a C++ library, basic standard C++ library, which has code that's supposed to work for thread all the time. Except that, and now that's the difference between OpenBSD and FreeBSD, on OpenBSD we don't have um, thread locally functions. We don't have those stuff where you can say, I think, set locally x or something like that, just for the current locally, and uh, where you can pass a locally as an extra parameter for everything that you're going to do. So, in that case, C long has some fallback mode. Like, it's going to get some very plainly named BSD locally fallbacks which is trying to do its best to define those functions anyway. Except that those functions are not always part of the C library. Why? Because they have only been defined in recent POSIX versions. So if you don't ask for anything, you're going to get everything from the C library. But, so this comes from here. If you ask for the wrong POSIX version, you're not going to get them. Like if you're saying you want POSIX 2001, since those are parts of POSIX 2008, you're not going to get them. And this is basically what Python was doing. So the fix here was more or less to look at the configure script for Python, figure out which defines it was trying to get Proposics, to change it to something more modern and hope for the best. Hoping for the best in this case is rebuilding the whole ports tree with a fixed Python, Python versions and checking that nothing else was breaking before I was able to commit that. And uh, yeah, I forgot to include that in my slides, but if you look at the, this part of configure for Python, you realize that those guys didn't know what they were doing. There's uh, mess of defines for different OSs that try to get every functions that they need, but nothing else on every operating system at the same time. And you've got comments that say more or less, okay, I'm going to try this, maybe, and with luck it's going to work, but I have no idea why. So, we were lucky because just fixing this worked and uh, we didn't have any issues with that. Next uh, what moment? I think you all know about uh, pointer arithmetic. What you probably don't know is that some people think that pointer are signed integers and that you can actually meaningfully compare them against each other. Not just for equality and difference, but that's right. For greater or equal than zero behavior. So this is a very much an improvement in Clang because instead of our old GCC was just saying, okay, yeah, let's do it, it works. Clang uh, just errors out in every mode telling you that you shouldn't ever compare a pointer uh, to be greater or smaller than zero. Um, I admit I haven't looked at recent architectures from close enough to know whether pointer are signed on anything that's used right now. But uh, this is obviously wrong code. Like in many cases, if you want to test whether you have a null pointer, you're going to compare it against zero and not anything else. It gets even more absurd, like when you look at functions that you know, and uh, when you see that 
people are actually writing code that looks like this. In general, you get very worried about the rest of the code. Because if people understand the C standard that bad, then it's very likely that the rest is going to be even worse. Even if you don't see it, and even if it does compile. So there are some ports which are more or less tagged by these patches, by these fixes, uh, which are under close observation and that we may decide to remove at some point because. Okay, who wrote this? Is this a JavaScript programmer or what? Doesn't, doesn't look like cheap. Um, you're going to learn even more new dialects of C, like for instance this one. There's obvious, obviously some guy somewhere who decided that in order to declare a type, struct or whatever, you had to put a time def in front of it. The big surprise is that this does compile with GCC 4.2. The type def is obviously not necessary. I have no idea where this comes from, where this comes from, and I have no idea how this could ever compile, but it does. Crazy, right? Oh yeah, and I uh, probably the biggest sweat of them all. It's uh, some security penetration test software, actually. So yeah, those guys are not well known to write quality code all the time. And this one is really funny. This is part of Nepen test, for whom C is obviously some kind of magic. Like, you know the syntax for four loops. Like, you've got three parts with the initialization part, then the test part, then the incrementation part. And in the initialization part, you usually put commas to separate two initializations. In the incrementation part, you usually put comma as well to separate incrementations. Why not do the same for the tests? Yeah, you're reading this right instead of an E of a logical end between both tests, they put a comma. It's magical. It's going to work, right? Uh, wrong. I have no idea uh, who could ever use this code and uh, have it do anything meaningful because it's so completely wrong. This is completely crazy. Um, some serious stuff now. After fixing lots of very stupid bugs and losing my mind uh, neuron by neuron, I uh, stumbled upon some real problems. Like thread local storage. So a bit of background. In lots of modern uh, operating systems, you have thread local storage. Not in OpenBSD for various reasons. Uh, the main reason being probably that the two people who might be able to implement it, Mark Ketenis and Philip Gunter, uh, have been saying for about two or three years that it's not quite ready yet. And the other part of the problem being that we want to try to make it work uh, the same way on every architecture. And so if it's not compiling on uh, Motorola 88000, it's probably not going to fly. Okay, that architecture is almost dead, VAX is dead. Yeah, right, we no longer have VAX support in OpenBSD, finally. And uh, maybe we'll get actual thread local storage at some point. So I stumbled upon some code, I don't remember which one, it was one of the web kit, I think, uh, which was definitely asking for thread local storage. And we didn't have it. And at the time, it was working using GCC from port, which does have something called emulated thread storage. So I tried to figure out whether I could do something that didn't use it. Spent a few hours trying to figure things out. When, at some point, by accident, Mark Tennis mentioned, you know, there is some emulated thread storage support in Clang as well. Maybe we could try to enable that. And boom, it took about five minutes to enable it, uh, half an hour to recompile Clang, 
and then it was working. So I'm of a mind that right now we no longer really need thread local storage. Uh, quick quiz, do you know any other operating system which doesn't have thread local storage? Alize? Android? There is no thread local storage on Android. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to answer this one. So this means, since there are at least a few installations of Android throughout the world, that simulated thread storage is going to keep working because there is no way that you're going to break such a huge install base. Oh wait, there are breaks in Windows about every two months. Oh well. Let's assume that real operating systems won't have this issue. How does it work? Uh, basically, it just uses uh, two thread functions. You've got the ability to set up some things that it's going to give you a, a hash that is uh, thread dependent. So you just look up uh, prefred key create and prefred set specific. And between those two, you have the ability to allocate memory from the process, store it into something that is uh, thread specific, and get it back and have the exact same address both times. So it just works. Uh, the what part concerning uh, this bug was that when looking at configure scripts, I realized that some software was able to use thread local storage, but if there was no thread local storage available, it would just compile and assume it would work, even threaded, without any kind of protection between several threads. Fun, right? Among those softwares, there's something which is called LibSSH, which is supposed to give you some kind of support for SSH, and which is going to work single-threaded, which is going to compile multi-threaded, but not work correctly if you don't have those functions. It's not going to say anything. It's going to say, okay, it's a broken OS. I don't have thread local storage. I'm going to do as if I had thread local storage. And if it doesn't work, who gives a shit? It's broken anyway. Cool. Um, some more actual information. At the start of the talk, I was uh, implying that we had lots of compilers in the tree and that it was complicated. And if you add Silang in base, then you get things even more complicated. Like the original fragment to support Silang on a port that used to need GCC 4.9 from the port 3 was looking like that. Perfectly sane and reasonable code for me. Like, okay, you just check your architecture, you just ask whether the best compiler is actually Silang. If it is, you've got a set of libraries you're going to depend on, the C++ libraries from base. If it's not, you're going to ask for GCC4 because you need the compiler. You're going to say that you're going to require C and C++ from GCC4 and that's it. Okay, so perfectly simple that in that slide I forgot to add the one clip for the GCC4 module. No, wait. It's providing it by default, which is already a bit crazy. Uh, so I gave my co-developer something that looked more or less like that. And I had some very interesting reactions from some of them. The main reaction was probably, <laughs> as you know, because Laundry always reacts like that when it doesn't get something. And uh, more reasonably, Antoine wasn't very happy with it either. So we decided to make something simpler. So as usual in OpenBSD, we tried several things very quickly because that's how it works. And two months later, uh, what we have looks more or less like this instead. 
quite simply, the first line is telling you that you're going to try to use GCC if you need it for a recent compiler, because if, if in base you have C-Long, then you're perfectly all right. Uh, this post compiler is only needed on MD64, because sometimes it's because you need more modern C++, sometimes it's because you need uh, atomics operations. VLC is one example of that, for instance. And the last line is very recent. It was committed uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, you're going to add to the set of libraries that you require only the libraries that are decided from the compiler model to support C++. Like if you've got long, it's going to be automatically the right libraries for long. If you've got the old GCC from the base system, it's going to be the right library. And if you've got GCC from the port three, it's also going to be the right library. This should be very simple with luck. And uh, even Landry is going to agree that uh, this is something you can work with, hopefully. Actually, this is also something that uh, everybody else can work with because it solves a very important problem for us, which is that when you have only GCC in base and GCC in ports, then you can fix the port tree to be sure that you have the right C++ library, which is different for GCC 4.9 and GCC 4.2. As soon as you have Clang used for uh, some important architectures, like MD64. Uh, the rest of the tree is going to be not quite dead, but uh, less well maintained. So that in the end, if you make some mistakes in those libraries, they will only be noticed if it happens on a mainstream architecture, like Intel uh, processors. So, if MD64 switches to C-Lang, then on MD64, you no longer use GCC at all, so you no longer make any distinction between the lib standard C++ from GCC in base and the lib standard C++ from GCC in ports. Which means that if you make a mistake and you put in the wrong library, nobody is going to notice until it's time to build the packages for the release, install them, and then everything is going to break on PowerPC, and Landry is going to go up again, as usual. So having something that's actually automatic and that's going to do the right thing most of the time is really necessary if we want to keep maintaining all architectures for maybe one or two more years. Yeah, I'm sorry, Antoine, but PowerPC is probably not going to die this year. Okay. Uh, less serious parts, I have some more fun. Again, a typical developer trying to do stuff. Because, seriously, after spending two months fixing 400 ports, it's really what it looks like, more or less. You get this kind of errors from uh, C-Lang. Like you see this declaration with a template, which has an included template, and somehow these guys thought it was a good idea to reuse the same parameter name for something completely different in inside the template itself. What? Looks so crazy, it doesn't work. Second one is probably a bit less what, at first glance, like you see some functions which are suddenly ambiguous, whereas they were not ambiguous at all before. What's going on here is that we have a compiler which uh, used to be before C++11, now is C++11, and instead of having all definitions that will get all types, like a template, any type, I have a div and I'm going to call the right function. We have some much more specific functions which work only on long or long double and shit like that. And if you don't have the exact same right type, then the catch-all template is not going to get it. So in order to fix this, uh, what you have to do is to actually choose a type that's really supported by the right div in the standard library and stuff like that. 
the next one was really funny for me. Oh, no, not, not that one, sorry. Uh, that one is really stupid. Uh, it's just missing const. Like you're going to get lots of C++ code where uh, in olden times you could get away without specifying whether it was const or not. And with a new, new library, in most cases, you have got for things to match. So in case you didn't know, this function is obviously usually a C function, except that when you look in the C++ library, you realize that it has got specific overrides for C++, one where the parameter is marked const, and the result is const as well, and one where the parameter is not const, and the result is not const as well. So they have to match, which means that in C++, you get rid of the annoying issue that when you implement this function in C, you definitely have to put a cast somewhere because the parameter is const and the result is not const. Not so in C++. Okay, the fun one is the next one. First time I saw this error, I thought, what the fuck? Most qualified identifier to find this declaration, and it's even very helpful in that the CLang compiler is going to tell you what you should do. But you should put an explicit this at this point so that it compiles. It looks so crazy that uh, I googled it. And I learned about something that I didn't know I needed, which is called two-phase dependent name lookup. You can look it up if you wish. There is a whole page on the LLVM um, blog where they document what's going on which is that there is a small paragraph in the standard that tells you that when you are looking up uh, names in a template, you actually have one first lookup, which is going to just look in the namespace of a template, and a second lookup, which might look up in the base classes of a class that you're defining in the template, assuming that you told the compiler that you're actually uh, looking at methods for the objects you're working on, and the only way you have of uh, specifying that is by putting an explicit this there. So the old compiler was simply not caring about that, that rule, and you really have to add this for it to work. What I find really funny, obviously, is that the compiler is going to tell you that you made a mistake that it knows exactly what's going on, and that it's going to give you the correction that you have to put into your code, but you still have to write it down. And it's completely crazy rule. If you haven't understood what I was saying, no problem. Nobody gets it the first time. Nobody gets it the tenth time, apparently, because there are still lots of these errors in lots of software. Uh, the big mystery being uh, how come that there is so much software that you can still find on FTP sites around the world where this stuff hasn't been fixed. It's probably not been touched for two years or so, maybe, at least. Or maybe people still compile everything on OpenBSD with GCC 4.2, which I doubt. I think that the rest of the world has moved to better and more modern compilers usually. Um, next one, probably the last one, slightly crazy as well. This code is part of Boost. And I don't know who wrote it, but it's, it's quite a good chance it's uh, Andrei Alexandrescu. If you don't know that guy, you should. He's the most crazy guy to write C++ code ever. Uh, there is something funny in this code which did break with long the first time. Precisely, it's that line. Dec type, some expression, comma, second expression. If you know your C++, modern C++, dec type is going to give you the type of the expression that you put after it. 
In this case, you have two expressions separated by a comma. It's the usual rule for comma in C and C++, which means that the first expression isn't really used at all, and that you're going to get the type of the second expression. Any idea what you, why you have this nonsense code in the boost library? Yep. <laughs> hmm? It's what? Yeah. yeah, basically what's going on, more or less that. Yeah, I'm going to, to, to say the answer. What you have here is that in order for this code to compile, both expression must be semantically valid. Even though you're not going to use the first type, if it doesn't compile, then deck type isn't going to work in that case. And what you have here, is actually a specialization of a template. And there are two possible cases. Either it's semantically valid, in which case you have this template active for the type that you are working on. Or it's not semantically valid, in which case this template is not active, and you're going to get the best template instead. Is convertible basic implementation. Uh, it's some magic having to do with type traits, where you're trying to figure out whether one given type uh, can be converted to another type at compile time. And so just being able to compute stuff on types like this is the condition used to be able to figure out whether you can convert one type to another. So why did this break? Just because Clang, in the end, doesn't really know what kind of compiler it is. Like, look at the compiler. It can support lots of stuff, including very modern C++, including deck type. Except that deck type itself is not active until you say that you're actually compiling C++ 11 code. If you're not, you don't have deck type. We have some internal which is called underscore underscore deck type. And while, when you're not in C++ 11 mode, this internal is going to be converted into a deck type without internal, without uh, underscore, sorry, by using a macro. So you just have just define, hash define, sorry, deck type of x to be underscore underscore deck type of x. Which obviously won't work at all if you've got a comma in between. So the fix in this case was either compile in C++11 and get lots of other issues, like having a boost that's not quite the same as the boost that we have for GCC was not such a good idea at the time. Or you can just simply say, oh, well, fuck it, and uh, we have the internal anyway, so replace this deck type with underscore underscore deck type, and so you've got the right internal, and it's going to work, which is what we did in the end. So this was probably the most fun puzzle that we had to solve. Uh, let's finish, that's probably enough word issues for one go. Last things that we haven't solved yet is this kind of issue. Now we are exiting the compiler part and uh, moving into the linker part. Apparently there is something really wrong with uh, the code that Silang generates on OpenBSD. Uh, because sometimes you're going to have uh, some collisions between uh, programs internal code and uh, library symbols. Uh, this is something that uh, doesn't affect FreeBSD at all, for instance. The reason for that is that OpenBSD is using Py everywhere. In case you don't know, Py means that we compile every executable as though it was shared library with position independent code. 
This means that we can load anything anywhere in memory, and this is very useful for randomization, obviously. But this confuses Siyank, which doesn't know whether it's compiling shared objects or actual programs, and uh, the linker itself can't make sense of whatever we end up with, and for now, we have these relocations. Uh, I have to ping my uh, favorite, well, my only Minutils developer, Ketanis. I could say it's the favorite one, but that would be a stretch. Uh, so that he eventually fixes this, and that we can compile the about 10 ports left that don't like this. Mm, okay, I'm going to pass this one because I'm already a bit long. Oh no, that's my last, my last. I didn't put a conclusion actually. Uh, so, what's the state of uh, the union right now? As of today, we have maybe 50 ports that don't compile with Clang. Uh, the only problematic ones for us are Chrome and LibreOffice. Chrome is getting solved. Once I have Chrome uh, compiling with Clang, uh, we can do some serious testing. Like right now, I'm si still using a GCC built laptop with uh, all applications because uh, I can't really live with a browser and a Firefox doesn't cut it. Sorry, laundry, again. Uh, so once I have Chrome, I can actually use it and test it for real. And there are obviously like 20 ports that don't really build. Some stuff nobody cares about. There's an old uh, voice recognition software that's been unmaintained for about 10 years. Uh, it's still using uh, C++ pre-98 uh, with iostream.h and stuff like that. And with luck, we should be able to switch in about six months. Um, the thing that I've learned while doing this, apart from the fact that every software is crap, which I already knew, was that uh, it's always beneficial to have several compilers and to look at the error and warning messages. Because uh, even if people are real careful, some of this code is not as crappy as what you've seen. Uh, they are going to make mistakes. And uh, all compilers have bugs. All compilers have different warning options. And the more of them you use, the more interesting issues you're going to find. And yes, we have to fix them in most cases. Or just drop the software if it's really beyond salvage. And I feel strongly that this is something that's really important if we want to have secure software, more secure software in the future. Uh, having proper tools, which means uh, using everything that you can to get warnings and errors and to fix them is, uh, in my opinion, the only way forward. And I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you.